the gospel this morning is found in the gospel of St. John, chapter 14, verses 23 to 27. This will also serve as today's sermon text. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and they will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Praise be to you. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the coolest transformations that we see in the history of God's people is the transformation we see in the disciples on Pentecost Sunday. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, all we saw the disciples do, or at least what it seemed like the disciples were doing most of the time, was failing. They didn't always know the answer. In fact, they often got the answer wrong. They misspoke so many times. When God would put them to the test, they always seemed to fail the test, not understand what Jesus was wanting them to do or what was going on. And we can just think about what happened about over 50 days before this event in Pentecost, on, during Holy Week, before Jesus suffered and died, or while he was suffering and dying. And even after, we see the disciples in the greatest test of their lives, the great everything that Jesus was teaching them, was preparing them for that main event. And all we see are, are the disciples failing even worse. They are ridiculed. They are... They're confused. They're abandoning Jesus. One of them betrays Jesus. The other one denies even knowing him. They do nothing to stop his arrest. They do nothing to really pay attention to what Jesus had to say. And Jesus was crucified right before their very eyes without much protest other than Peter pulling a sword. But even then, he was acting incorrectly. But now we fast forward 50 days to Pentecost. And what do we see? We see the same group of men standing in front of the people, proclaiming the message of God in all the languages that were there that day. And we watch Peter stand up and proclaim that Jesus is the Savior of the world in the very city where Jesus died. Now these disciples are unafraid. This isn't the same, this is the same group, but not the same reaction of what we see even on Easter Sunday. We saw these same men hiding in a locked room because they refused to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Instead, they were waiting or hiding and hoping that they wouldn't be next. So what changed? How were the disciples, all of a sudden, these awesome believers, brave in everything they were able to do and unafraid of what might happen to them? And really, if we boil down to nothing really changed, did it? I mean, these were the same men. They didn't change. They were still the sinners that we knew before, people who will later make more mistakes, people who make mistakes, people who sin, people who don't always do what God wants them to do, people who are imperfect. They didn't all of a sudden become perfect believers. And it isn't as if the God's enemies stopped fighting against them. I mean, Jesus rose from the dead. He defeated them. But that didn't mean that the devil couldn't convince people to come to hell. So he was fighting just as hard, if not harder, against God's people. And so the, the enemies of God were still fighting. The world was still evil and sinful and also fighting against them. So nothing really changed. And Jesus was still with them. Even though he ascended into heaven, 
he was still with them. He promised to be with them, and he never left them, just like he's never left us. And God's promises were still his promises, because God doesn't take his promises away. So if we look at everything, nothing really changed, and yet we see the disciples acting so much differently than how we're used to seeing them. What, I guess, changed, if you want to call it that, was now the disciples were finally putting their trust in the promises of God. Because God had promised all of this. And that's what our lesson for today shows us. Jesus is promising them, I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And this is what he's going to do for you. He's going to remind you of everything I've taught you. He's going to help you remember all the things I have taught you, all the messages you need to share. In fact, he's going to help you speak them. And you're going to speak them to all these people. And God is going to bless you. In fact, because the Holy Spirit is going to remind you of these words, and because you will have them so fully in your life, you're actually going to have peace. Because God is not going anywhere. And the disciples, I guess, finally just trusted. And they let God work. And they rested in the promises of God. And God came through for them, just like he said he would. We think back to the lives of the disciples. Think back to some of the times they were put to the test to trust the promises of God. There was one moment where... The disciples were in a storm and they were trying to roll home. And Jesus wasn't there at first until he showed up walking on water. It was Peter who eventually called out, Lord, let me come out to you. And Jesus promised that he could. And Peter at first does an amazing thing. He gets out of the boat. He actually starts walking on water. But what does he do? He begins to doubt. He begins to question this reality. And he begins to question the promises of God and therefore starts sinking. We might even think to the moments just before that walking on water, Jesus was with a large crowd in a deserted area and the people were getting hungry. And Jesus looks at the disciples and says, give them something to eat. And the disciples, they look at all the options and they realize it's impossible to feed this many people. But they... But instead of going to God and saying, Lord, this is impossible, only you can do this, they still were trying to figure out how they could manage to do this, and they began to panic, and they thought there was no hope. It wasn't until Jesus gave thanks and then fed everyone, all 5,000 men plus women and children. Or we might think of the time, one of the first times that Jesus told the disciples, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And then I'm going to rise again. And instead of praising Jesus for this ultimate sacrifice to save the world, it was Peter and really the rest of the disciples who pulled him aside and said, this shall never happen to you. They tried. They rebuked him for saying he was going to save the world by dying. Now, if the disciples had acted appropriately, so imagine Peter, he didn't doubt one bit, walked on water, and Jesus and him walked all the way to shore, uh, walked all the way to shore on that water, never got back in the boat. Or think about that, the feeding of the 5,000, or even the 4,000, that is also recorded, where the disciples said, Lord, this is impossible for us, but with you all things are possible. Lord, help us in our time of need. And Jesus then would have, and Jesus then fed everyone. Or even think about when Jesus said, I'm going to suffer and die and rise again. And the disciples said, awesome, this is amazing. I can't believe you would do this for us, Lord. This is so great. You are truly our great and glorious God. How in awe of these men we would be. We say, wow, what great faith. These guys knew what was going on. No wonder they're disciples of Christ. These are truly the men who should be leading the church. But instead, that's not how they acted. But if they had, would that be any more impressive than what we see on Pentecost? With them trusting in those promises of God so firmly 
be any different than what they were doing when they stood up and proclaimed God's word in an enemy city. It actually wouldn't. Because they would have displayed great faith in that God was going to take care of them, that God was going to provide for them, that God could do what he said he was going to do, and that God is the, and that Jesus is the Savior of the world. All they would have been doing is resting in the promises of God, letting God and trusting that God was going to keep his word, and then just let it, and then just seeing what happens. Their lives would have been so much easier, they would have truly been at peace. Sometimes in our lives, we might look at someone and see a great act of faith. We might see someone believe that God is going to help them even in the worst times of their life. We might see someone bravely proclaim God's word to a stranger and not back down. And we might see other things going on. And we might say, wow, that person has great faith. I wish... I was like them. But the, and the answer to that whole statement is you are just like them. You are just like the very disciples who stood up on Pentecost. You are just like them. For you too are sinners. You too are in need of a Savior. You too also, though, have the same promises from God. God promises you that no matter what happens to you in this lifetime, you are going to be just fine. In fact, he's going to bless your situation for you spiritually so that you can remain his child, so that you can be with him in heaven one day. And God promises that he will provide for you, and even with prices going up, he's going to take care of you and give you your daily bread. That is his promise to you. His promise is also to forgive you of all your sins so that when you do falter like the disciples did so often, that he will still forgive you and restore you and bring you back. That is his promise to you. All he asks us to do is trust him. But so often we fail that test, don't we? Just like the disciples, we don't trust in these promises. We listen to the news now. We're hearing mass shooting after mass shooting, even more, even more readily than we're used to. And we might think, oh no, we can't be at peace. Oh no, everything's going wrong in this world. And then we might hear how everyone wants, how maybe our government is always trying to look to take certain freedoms we've grown accustomed to away from us. And we might say, oh no, what's going to happen? We're not going to be safe. We're not going to be at peace. Or we might hear someone going through a really rough time and we, or that rough time is entering into our lives. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's, maybe it's someone else that you know and love is not doing so well. And you think, oh no, this person doesn't have peace. Or no, I can't have peace with this person suffering the way that they are. But these are the things that have been going on in the world since sin entered it. And yet God still looks, us today, looks at us today, today and says, you're at peace. I give you my peace. I promise you my peace. I promise you that you can still be joyful and confident and at peace. No matter what, that's his promise to you. All we have to do is just trust him. And look at what happens when we just trust him. God comes through. God promised the disciples, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to help you remember everything I said. Do you think Peter, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, could have pulled out that passage from Joel and known that everything was going to be great and the Holy Spirit was going to come and we're, and we're going to be just fine and proclaim it boldly? No, absolutely not. Because he doesn't act that way. He doesn't act that confident. He's confident in himself, but then he finds out that that was wrong. But he's not confident in this, and so he's not ready. Because he didn't trust. He didn't trust in God. He trusted in himself, and he failed miserably. But look at what happens when he fell into the promise of God. And just let God rule and trust that God was going to take care of him. And call, and in, almost in a sense, test God in this. It all worked out. He remembered. He spoke. 
It was very successful. Those promises will be for you too. Because they are your promises. Because you are children of God. God has called you to be his child. He's brought you to faith by that very Holy Spirit. He will keep all of those promises. Whether it's he will help you speak when you're trying to proclaim God's word to someone. Or he will forgive you your sins when you turn to him and, and confess. Or that he will make all things work out for your good no matter what is going on. When we realize that and just trust it and believe it and let God do it without us questioning it, then we're really at peace. We're no longer stressed over, oh no, what's going to happen? God's got it. We're okay. Oh no, what's the future going to hold? It's okay. God has that too. Oh, what am I going to say? Don't worry. God's with you. He's got that too. Oh no, I've sinned and I've done something horrible. You're forgiven. For Jesus died for that sin too. When we fall into the promises of God and, and just trust that God is going to do it, then we'll be just as brave, just as confident, and just as at peace as these men were on Pentecost. It's a peace that this world cannot give us. Only God can, and it can only happen when we trust Him. Now we might think, oh, i got to make sure I study God's Word so that I trust this peace more often. Well, yes, studying God's Word is super important. This is what God wants you to do. There's nothing we can do in order for us to be better Christians or to be more faithful or to be more worthy of trusting in these promises. No, God's already done it. It's a simple act of faith, a faith that you already have, a faith that lets go. And holds on to what God has said. And so whatever is going on, whatever this summer might bring, whatever your life has in store for you, know that you can still be at peace no matter what, because you have God's promises. And because of those promises, we will be just fine. And we just get to sit back and watch our God in action. And we'll see what he has in store for us. But whatever happens in this life, we know one thing for certain. Whatever happens, we know where we're going to be. And that gives us the ultimate peace, because we'll be with our God forever in heaven. Amen. Please rise.